So Sandbox Geospatial Limited is a system geospatial intelligence company with over 30 years of professional service experience in the industry and with seven years experience in the Nigerian market. We are the sole distributor of S3, AV, Trimble, and Wintra drones in Ghana, Nigeria, Liberia, Gabon, Sierra Leone, and Equatorial Guinea, where we offer expertise in the deployment of geospatial solutions across many industries. Our geospatial solutions cut across land administration, banking, education, government, utilities, health, mining, manufacturing, oil and energy, real estate, telecommunication, public safety, sustainable development, and maritime, just to name a few. We are also backed with uh, several partners across the countries we operate in. They assist us to reach all the industries amicably. This includes support systems, acute geospatial, West Blue, among others. We also have many organizations which have benefited from our expertise, including the Ghana Health Service, Nigeria Center for Disease Control, Surplus Petroleum Company Limited, Liberia Institute of Statistics and Geoformation Services. And we also have several land administration agencies that we have worked with, that, and we are also currently working with them. We have uh, Abia GIS, we have Nasara GIS, we have Abuja GIS and Kano GIS. We also have Ghana Land Administration. So at this junction, I would like to quickly run you through the lineup of events. We shall be having the opening speech from the Managing Director of Sambos Position Limited, Mrs. Ikua. This will be followed by a keynote address from the Nigeria Sovio General of the Federation, Sovio Adinion. Then we will go into presentations by speakers from our franchise partners, S3 and Trimbu. After the presentation, we will give opportunities for questions and feedback. And at the end of it all, our general manager, Mrs. Joy Imai in Nigeria, will be giving the closing remark. So just before I continue, uh, let me quickly mention some ground rules. If you are not presenting, we urge you to make sure your microphone is always muted. If you want to make any comments or have you have additional questions, you can make use of the chat box or the Q and A section. So, so please welcome with me our managing director for her opening address. Eko, I'll over to you, please. Thank you, Clement. Um... You've, you've set the ball rolling very high. I hope I can continue with the momentum. Um, <laughs> my name is um, Ikria Apua. I am the Managing Director of Sambas. Uh, I have my video on. I don't know if you can see me, but I hope the light is good enough so you can see me from here. I'm speaking from... You. Sure. <clears throat> I'm speaking from our Accra, Ghana office. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to speak to you this morning and to welcome you most cordially to this year's Sambos Geospatial Nigeria Stakeholders Conference. Sambos has been operating for 34 years in the West African region. And as part of that operation, Sambos Geospatial Nigeria Limited was established in 2014 as a way of extending our geospatial solutions across the West African region. As of today, we can boast of our business operations in Gabon, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Equatorial Guinea, and Liberia. <clears throat> Within the past year, we have seen major milestones achieved by key stakeholders in dealing with the COVID-19 situation. And today, the virtual platforms have become the go-to avenue for most events. It is my hope that by next year, with all the measures being put in place on curbing COVID-19, I will be meeting you all physically at our next year's event. At this virtual conference, we are fortunate to have the support of the Surveyor General of the Federation of Nigeria, whom you will be hearing from shortly at this conference. Thank you and we are honored to have you be our keynote speaker today. I would like to recognize all our distinguished attendees here today, 
esteemed representatives of the surveying and land administration agencies of various Nigerian states and other stakeholders in the industry who are joining us in today's discussion. Thank you all for being here. Permit me to express my deep appreciation to our franchise partners, Esri and Trimble, for their continued support. This morning, we will be having them speak to us about topics centered around our theme, land administration through geospatial intelligence. I would also like to recognize the Sambus Nigeria team who have put this together. I'm very proud of them for, for being thoughtful on this engaging program. For those who are new to Sambus Geospatial and attending the stakeholders event today, what we are doing today reflects us as an organization, recognizing the importance of a collaborative framework between Sambus and its key stakeholders. This platform is to build deeper connections and understanding with those who are currently engaging new technologies in land administration and finding ways to support the government in the effort to improve land management in the country. We want to listen to your thoughts and more importantly, share innovative ideas and solutions that would be beneficial to your objectives. In a positive outlook, we aim to accomplish our common goal of embracing key ingredients of geospatial transformation and to build sustainable infrastructure that would make a difference within the decision and policy-making process in land administration in West Africa. We would want to see Nigeria being the most populous country in West Africa, take the lead in this initiative. And we would ask that you feel free to identify the missing links and probable solutions with us so that the relevance of land administration in Nigeria can be further enhanced. Thank you once again, and I do hope you enjoy the conference. Over to you, Clement. Thank you very much, Iqbal. That was a very nice um, one. In fact, I'm excited that you, you, are, you are ready to join us in Nigeria for the next uh, meeting physically. We hope that this pandemic wraps up on time. So uh, next in line, we, we're going to be having the Soviet General of the Federation, Soviet Taiwo Adineron, who, who will have the next session. So the Taiwo has held several positions in, and, uh, in some in various capacities with express spanning over 30 decades in Nigeria. He was the former director of International Boundary just before his appointment uh, by the Honorable Minister of Works and Housing in 2019. And he has laboriously been overseeing the affairs of the Office of the Solar General of the Federation since his appointment. So your Taiwo, please, you are welcome. You can go on with your presentation. Thank you, my brother. And uh, permit me to first of all thank the organizer of this meeting, Sambus Geospatia. It is my pleasure to be here, and I'm happy for what is happening uh, in Africa with uh, Sambus support and what they have been able to do. I'm also glad that you are giving us this privilege to present or to make presentation. Like Riley says, since the time I came on board, we have been trying to see how we can make impact, be more relevant, and do more advocacy in geospatial activities and services in Nigeria. So I thank you all for this opportunity. If I understood you quite well, you want me to go on with my presentation now? Yes, please, sir. All right, thank you. Can you see the screen? I'm sharing my paper already. Yes, we can see it now, sir. All right.
Just like what we mentioned earlier, I'm going to start talking or presenting the paper on land administration through geospatial technology, which is a major team. And uh, this is the outline I'm going to talk about. Introduction, characteristics of land, land administration, land importance, relationship between land and economy, land and poverty alleviation, geospatial technology, component of geospatial technology, evolution of geospatial technology, digitization, automation, land administration, operationability, and then conclusion. I'm not going to be telling us something that is so new to all of us. I'm sure we are all familiar with what land is. Land is not just only the surface of the health surface, but it has everything with it. The earth surface that, and the land beneath and every mineral resources in, in, within the surface of the hand. I'm sure all of us understood that. And yes. it is also considered, it is also considered as a powerful resource for all human development and existence. Like we all know is a major factor in, in production. It's for the, it was even further buttresses by the assertion by Machi Turner in 2005 that without a doubt, land is of the most important asset in any economy. There are several characteristics of land, which I'm going to quickly go through. Land is a free gift of nature. Nobody manufactured it. It is just there. It was freely given to us. Of course, while we are actually on the hard surface, we've turned land is an asset. We buy it, we transfer it, we do all manners of things with it. But nature gave it freely to us. It's a fixed quantity, it's a, it's a fixed asset. Land does not undergo any change, express, except probably some denudation or possibly erosion or desertification. It is limited and cannot be increased or decreased with human effort. No alteration can be made on the surface of the earth, except maybe when we are doing some exploration. And of course, we also encourage ourselves to make sure that after we are done our exploration or done something on land, we try as much as possible to return it to the state where which we found it. It is permanent, it is always there. Even when there is any act of, uh, like any act of natural occurrence, like fire or like flooding and so on and so forth, land is still there. Land is primarily factor of production, I said it earlier, is a passive factor of production. It does not bring anything house by itself, rather, is it, it, we, we have to add to it. We have to think of what we are going to use the land for. It is immovable, it is always there. Of course, in some circumstances, it can be moved by probably land movement or tectonic movement, or possibly maybe earthquake, but essentially the land is still there. It, is, it has original indestructible power. There's nothing you can do to land. It is there, you can't destroy it. Of course, you can deface it, but you cannot destroy it. There are various types of fertility within land. And I'm sure we all, all of us agree with me that uh, once you can plant a particular crop somewhere, you may not necessarily be able to plant all crop there because they have different fertility. And that is where, why most times we are even also useful to farmers in telling them exactly what type of crop that can survive on their land using our GIS tool. Land is inelastic. You can't really extend it. Of course, even when you do sand filling of the ocean, ocean, ocean part, it is still sure that where you are still sand filling, land was still under it. Land has many issues like we all know. And uh, in the course of this presentation, we are talking about land administration, that we have to put land to a better use. What is essentially is land administration? My personal uh, definition of land is that is a system, land administration is the systemic management of land and its attributes and resources for optimal utilization and benefit that has the ability to translate into multiplier effect of empowering people, alleviating poverty, through the release of locked up capital in an encumbered land. An encumbered land is a land that has good title, that does not have any contention, 
your title is very correct and good. It is important to clarify again that land management is different from land administration. Land management is the activity associated with land as a resource to achieve social, environmental, and economic sustainable development. It is part of the infrastructure that supports good land administration. Land administration is like a universal set, and land administration is a tool to be able to get the land managed properly. Now, as we all know, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe in its land administration guideline define land administration as a process of determining, recording, and disseminating information about ownership value of land and the, its associated resources. These processes include the determination sometimes call adjudication of land rights and other attributes. Surveying and, survey and describing this, there are detailed documentation and the provision of relevant information for support land markets. According to UNEC again, it is believed in an ideal environment that land administration should guarantee ownership and secure the title support the land and property tax system, a kind of raising the high GR of any country or any environment, constitutes, constitutes, excuse me, constitutes security for credit system, develop and monitor land market, protect state lands, and also it's going to reduce land, this facilitate land reform, like we did around 2007 in Nigeria. And essentially the reform we were doing then was as regards the tightly. Thinking then or trying to resolve the, land, the, the, the length of time that we can actually get a title document or like your C of O. We, the essential land reform operation we did then was to reduce the time used to secure C of O, improve urban planning and infrastructure development, support land management based on consideration for environment, and then produce statistical data that actually can give us the status of the land within an entity or a state or a community. For the purpose of this tool, an administration system understood to mean all the infrastructure necessary for the implementation of process, such as institutional arrangement, legal framework, land information system standards, and the management and this the simulation of system and technology necessary for implementing these guidelines. Land administration before 1993. This is quite interesting to me. It is a common fact that the term land administration was coined in 1993 by the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe in its land administration guidelines. And uh, actually it kept me thinking, was it in 1993 that we all started land administration? For land administration actually have been with us for quite some time. I want to believe that in whatever form. Land administration started from the origin of man. And I have this land administration actually started before the call of the European Convention on Human Rights signing room on, on November 4th, 1950, that that article said that every natural or legal person is entitled to the peaceful enjoyment of his possession. I want to believe that possession includes land. No one shall be derived, deprived of his possession except in the, in the public interest and subject to condition provided by law and by the general principle of inter, international law. This is a kind of a form of land management because I believe that possession actually contains uh, your land possession. Actually, it was signed in 1950 at the first European Convention Protocol. Also in Nigeria, we had Land Use, land use Act. It was promulgated in 1978, and uh, which vested all the land in every state, in, every, in each governor of the state. Of course, I think I should have this, 
by before 1978, it was an Akulian task to get land for public use. And during that time, we had a military government. The head of state then promulgated this land use decree then, which later turned into an act. And uh, for all you care, my people say exactly what you did that made you a wise person. Is that thing that you will still do that we make you me, somebody less than a wise person. We have been trying frantically in Nigeria, and I know within too long, we'll be able to amend this particular act. They did it then so that the military the government can be able to have houses without any disturbances in any state. And like you know, it's a kind of a direct command from the CNC who actually was a military officer and every governor were under him. In the political dispensation, that has changed. Nigeria is a federating state of 36 state capital with one FCT, federal capital territory. Why land administration? It is a expedient and necessary to every country to have land policy and land planning system to improve social, physical, special, and economic imbalance. Land policy provides the framework, direction, and continuity of decision made on the function of land in the implementation of the National Development Plan, which involves local states and regional government. The challenge is not only to meet the world population for food, shelter, and quality of life. Of course, all these are important, but to ensure that future generations have their needs. This is a kind of a sustainable development aspect of land that we should not mortgage the, 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 the future of our young or born children. Whatever we are doing, this too should be able to enjoy the benefits from land just as we are doing now without mortgaging their, their rights. The need for sustainable development and the role land administration plays is in support of such goal is not in doubt. Sustainability is no longer an option. It is an essential thing that we all have to imbibe. Therefore, the world needs to develop more intense and sustainable use of the land through land administration. Like I said earlier, land management is the global thing. Why land administration is a, is, is a subset of the land management. Waste space by abusing the land should be, should be seen as a, as a crime. You use land anyhow, you degrade it. I think should be, should, people should be informed that all those things they are doing is going to have it at either direct or indirect effect on the economy of that environment. So each and every state should look at it seriously. As the national economy cannot progress in an unstable development and, and a sustainable development will not actually be achieved. This guideline defines land administration as process of determining, recording, we said it earlier, the information about ownership and the tenure and then the value of land. The relationship between land and economy. We all know that factor of production, land is one of those four factors. The factor of production are building block of economy. We have the entrepreneurship as one of the factors of production. We have land, we have capital, and then we have human capacity <clears throat> to let us know how important land is in the economy. Everything, every development happens somewhere. This includes everything obtained from land, hydrocarbon, gold, copper, bitumen, and agricultural forests, building infrastructure, among others. Land is considered as a long-term asset, typical on the balance sheet because it's unexpected it is expected not to be converted to cash within the shortest possible time. It's regarded as a, as a fixed asset. This is true. Of course, land is an asset. Most times when you need a quick cash, there's no guarantee as such that you may quickly be able to transform it into capital, but you can still do that. But alternatively, the person who have tenure security like CFO can move reliably, use the title as collateral, to secure loans or to secure facility from bank because the CFO is actually, a, 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 can be used as collateral to get capital. The nexus between land and poverty elevation. This is leveraging on potentials land and creating wealth for the growing population, unlocking the capital in land among poor by strengthening the security of tenure. The, the poor who have access to land can, can access loan leads to economic growth 
the concept has been advocated as poor, poor in land administration. I'm sure I'm not telling anybody on this platform anything new concerning this. Yes, I haven't gone through all those things on land administration, the importance of land, and how we have been actually managing our land using land administration with the appropriate tool. Here comes your special technology. It's a term to describe the range of modern technology and tool contributing to the, ge the ge 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 geographic mapping and analysis of the heart and human society. Geographic information system, remote sensing, surveying global positioning system, continu continuous operating reference stations, photogrammetry of man area vehicles, and LIDAR technology, among others. These are the tools that we use in geospatial technology. And this same tool can actually be, be used for land management, land administration, to get the better out of our land. You know that there are technology that relates to collecting and processing of data, and all these are asso associated with location. When you're talking about geospatial technology, you're talking about collection or processing of data that is associated with location, that is, it has geographic addresses. Geospatial technology is used to collect, analyze, store geographic information. It uses software to map geographic location while analyzing the impact of human activities and some other things. These are the component of geospatial technology. It involves GPS, which is global positioning system, GRS, remote sensing, and so on. This technology offers a radically different way in which we produce and use map required to manage our community and industry. You will agree with me, with me that each or two, the equipment and the procedure that we normally use to acquire geospatial information in some 30, 40 years ago has been changed due to this technology. Those days, you need to have your children lights and then you have to see the connection between the two points all the time. And then you have to carry your levels to site to one level and be able to get the topography of an environment. But today with geospatial technology, it's a lot easier and it saves us a lot of time and resources. Structural component, structure, structural component of geospatial technology, as we can see, the GIS spatial analysis, desktop, web, web, web cloud, mobile, GNS positioning, navigation, indoor positioning, surveying, then art observation, then the other processing and scanning. GPS, I'm sure we are all, we are all, aware, we are all familiar with it to acquire data, to get coordinates, and then to use it to, to process, and then get our model of the house office at, at any point in time. Then the satellite of the GPS are arranged evenly around the house, so there are at least four visible, this is the principle of GIS and this, sorry, GPS, and this is how you can acquire data when you are using GPS. And as a matter of fact, it has been improved over time. We have the GPS, we have the wide area of organization services, and uh, we have, uh, today, we have uh, high targets. We have high targets. And uh, may I tell us here, there's a program we are embarking on in Nigeria to install about 200 call station as a kind of infrastructure for mapping, which we believe is going to facilitate the production of our mapping in infrastructure. And then it's going to hit our mapping processes. And uh, of course, you all will agree with me that for developing countries like ours, paucity of funds I mean, is a recurrent issue. And of course, despite that, we are trying to put our mouth, sorry, to put our money where our mouth is. What we do these days is that we align our responsibility or mandate of the Surveyor General Office in Nigeria with government priority and activity. Remote sensing, acquisition of images and information without physical contact. We all know that collection of information about heart without touching it or form of remote sensing. Satellite imagery, GIS, mapping projects, serve as a source of information and data 
to support analysis, classification for geospatial assessment and modeling. This is talking on remote sensing. These are images of remote sensing. This is the satellite acquiring images on a particular surface of the Earth's surface. And uh, you know, most times some of these images, uh, some of these satellite images are programmed to capture information on our surface on a regular basis. GIS is the use of man, machine, and human being to capture, to analyze, to present spatial reference data. It is a mapping tool for analysis of geospatial data, which is georeference. GIS is used to support environmental management, natural hazard, disaster. Essentially, GIS is used for decision taking. And uh, if you have tool to take the decision properly, it has a kind of direct or, inter or indirect effect on the economy of that environment. When you are making informed, when, when you are making evidence-based informed decision, you can be sure you hardly get wrong decision or you, are, you hardly get it wrong. It's required the use of computer, like I said earlier, to acquire geo reference data for decision making. These are the components of GIS, people, data analysis, hardware, and software. These are the layers, the products of GIS. You agree with me that, but if you want to, there are two engines, you have the, you have the, you, you, you have the attribute engine and then you have the, the, the map engine. It is the attribute and then the map that the GIS, the GIS we work on to really give all the solution to the queries that we are giving to it. Of course, there are geofencing. It is a feature in a software program that uses the global positioning system or radio frequency ident identification, RFID, to define geographic boundaries. Geofencing allows an administrator to set up triggers. So when the device enter or exit, the boundary defined, the administrator is being alerted. This is a very good one, particularly when your responsibility is to determine or to really monitor the environment for land administration. And whatever is happening in that area with this geofencing, you can actually be able to know. This is one of the good tools in uh, geospatial for land administration. More images on land administration. You see all the maps. There's an example on the left, which is geofencing within that area. Whatever is happening there, you will be able to know exactly what is going on within that environment without actually being in that environment. And you will agree with me, it's going to help and facilitate land administration properly. Other imaging technologies. We all know that the technology is not static. It's, it's changing every day. And uh, that is why all of us should be abreast of uh, the advancement in the technology as regards the geospatial information. We have the unmanned vehicle system and drones, scanning, artificial intelligence, AI, smart sensor and internet of things, immense technologies, simulation and connectivity. Digitalization. This is just a process whereby most African countries and not too distant time ago, almost every activities on land administration have been in an analog form. And it has given us a lot of challenges that you need to stop file somewhere. You need to be searching for information concerning somebody. When somebody wanted to dispose his property or his land somewhere, you may not be able to ascertain the information you are getting. But with the digitalization of this system, you are transforming what you have. Adaptation of a system process is easy to operate with the use of computer and the internet. Allow companies, government agencies to sell good without the physical presence, the process of converting something to digital format. Like I was trying to say, A lot of what we were doing before were in analog. Make your map, and then you start with somewhere and start looking for it. And again, if anybody.
uh, all, all kind of stockpile. We'll be searching the archive with little or no, uh, with little or no confidence or, or, or surety or guarantee that we get, you even get what you are looking for. Land operationability. Today, geospatial technology means that land administration system increasingly be implemented for benefit of all. It is now possible to, con to connect approaches to capturing the unrecorded geometry of boundaries for the billions of unrecorded units. In addition, new approaches are becoming apparent, very clear for the maintenance of collected data. Of course, we talk about satellite the other time, and then these are the product, product of satellite, imageries. Imageries are produced by satellite, we all know. Of course, we have small drones these days again that can do a similar thing. All these are tools in geospatial technologies that we can adopt to actually strengthen our land management, land administration system and make our job easier. Uh, I, I remember not too long ago, I think uh, Ismet Muner, the CEO of uh, Ordinance of it, was interviewed in Nigeria as regards the low mapping activities of uh, Africa. And uh, it's actually been taking its toll on so many African countries that we have been losing so much resources without doing that. And, and of course, somebody has kind on in that presentation that if he was given some money, what, what would I have been able to do to help countries that have not been mapping their country properly? His response was very interesting. He said he has to interface with that person and the head of the mapping agency in that country to know the gap and what are their essential needs. Then we talk about standard. Global standards such as land administration domain model, focus of standardization, modeling, information at the conceptual level. The model does not include processing for initial data acquisition, data maintenance, and data publication. This is because those processes were considered to be country specific when the first addition of LEDM was prepared. Some people are raising their hands. Let me continue. The fit for use, the fit for purpose land administration approach arguably allow for identification of more generic, I mean general process related modules in data acquisitions and data handling. Standardization can also make it easier to monitor the progress of global indicators relating to land tenure security. Of course, standardization also will promote interoperationality. That is to say, information from different environments when there are standards and they're using the same standard one will be able to match and flow from one system, from one imagery or from one information to the other. Creating tenure atlas. Land tenure atlas could be developed to provide an overview of the spatial distribution, legitimate tenure type throughout a country. The customary, the, the, the customary informal private public or otherwise, the atlas be further include the layer for national an administrative boundary and potentially a layer for plan and ongoing project in land administration. Utilizing devices. Utilizing, no. This, uh, this is linking functionali fu functionalities for image based acquisition to handle GPS, biometric data, finger thumb, and so on. Land data are collected on many devices could deliver results in format based on operational standards. And when there are standardization, information from different uh, acquisition or from different uh, sources can actually be matched and be stitched together for better appreciation. Integration with OGS, operation, sorry, open geospatial consortium. Recognize that worldwide effective and efficient ambition is an ongoing concern. Economic growth and property risk of data loss, failure due to disaster and lack of interoperability. Open Geospatial Consortium Land Administration Domain Working Group are seeking to identify enabling standards and best practices to guide countries in a pragmatic way towards establishing more cost effective, efficient, and interoperable, interoperable land administration capability.
The geospatial industry provides the product and services in support of numerous of important processes required in fit for use purpose. Land administration, image based acquisition of cadastral boundaries need access to huge image library to support large scale implementation. Industrial approach, sorry, industrializing approaches. In the use of photo photo to produce spatial framework, the image is typically linked to national geodetic reference frame through GNSS in space or the aircraft on the ground. Furthermore, automated feature extract, extraction and future classification appear to be very promising development for the generation of coordinates of visual objects from imagery. Developing cooperation. Enabling standards are also being developed with other domain working group with OG, OGC, such as land infra partnership licensing, other association and, stand, and standard development organization will be developed to address interoperability issues that span the land and session community of parties, geographic information system, and the broader IT environment. Example includes link, linkages with ISOTC 201 regarding the LADM as well as those SDO responsible for IT standards related to topics such as security, the internet, and mobile services. Modernizing demarcation. Demarcation with picking often takes 80 to 90 percent of the obvious time. This was part of the thing we wanted to really change during the land reform in Nigeria to reduce the time of processing uh, land title. It is a good idea to explore modern demarcation method and it could produce good alternative. Modern markers like the traceable 3D, I mentioned earlier RFID markers can be detected and identified from a distance of several meters using the simple smartphone. The RFID is the, is the marker can store administrative and political land, um, sorry, positional data. They could be used as due reference markers. The drone technology is also there. It's also actually coming into our practice whereby you can quickly get the imagery of a small area and then you can, you can do your job. And this can be used for small estates whereby you can capture the information you require to prepare a kind of a database for the estates in question. Logistics. Data acquisition may concern million of spatial units for which people and relationship have to be determined. The organization of this process requires geospatial support in logistics and case of task management based on geo information. This starts with gaining an overview of the density of information. Logistics activities include the process of creating awareness of land announcing participation, approaches agreeing on citizen role in the administration process and publishing status, information online or offline, as well as performing checks on completeness before leaving the location. Collecting copy of people's ID, photo like a kind of a bio data, recording required few devices, but and, and so on. These are actually being made use easier by just special technology. Data maintenance can be program driven, systematic or sporadic, Program driving means a complete and systematic new acquisition after some time. Sporadic means case by case, the transaction driven way and relate to transaction in the land market. This is like a kind of uh, a digital database where you can quickly assess the information you are looking for as regards a particular parcel of land without the tutorial work of trying to check through a pile of files and so on and so forth. Quality of building can be part of the maintenance process. It is, a cool, it is crucial that co collected using survey approaches based on different approaches can be integrated together. This may require adjustment of new observation to existing coordinates in the feed or within GIS. The geospatial technology has really made a lot of these things easier. All you needed to do is to have a good frame of a continuously operating reference station that are well, that are within range that they can do a lot of work. So this, this can actually assist in the production of a current map and probably it's going to even assist in being able to uh, update your, your map on a regular basis. I really want to close by actually giving this remark. 
it has been established that land is a major factor of production. Effective and efficient management of the true process of determining, recording, and disseminating information about the ownership value and the use of land is associated and is associated resources with appropriate technology will translate to sustainable development. And this is the uh, advice I want to give to my fellow people around the around Africa and that we are on this platform today. So thank you so much for listening to me. I hope I wasn't telling you too much of what we have knew before. And I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk on this platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Adinero. That was a very beautiful presentation. In fact, I, 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 learned, I learned a lot. The, the, the part you mentioned that land management is different from land administration, and the explanation was very concise and precise. But during your presentation, there was some question on the Q&A, but we won't be taking them now. We would like to take all questions at once after the other pre uh, presenters, after other speakers have presented their yeah, slide. So, uh, thank you very much once again, Mr. Uh, we'll yeah, welcome, we'll go. my brother. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. So, um, next we we will be having Marco Scupa from from Trinidad Geospatia for his own presentation. Marcos, are you there? Yeah, Marcos. Hello, Marcos. Hello. Hello, everyone. Could you, could you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK, great. Yeah, thank you for joining us. You can go on with your presentation. OK, then I will share my screen. So I cannot share my screen um, because someone other is sharing his screen. Okay, let me let me stop sharing my screen now. So, I can do that. so I try now. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So, hello everyone, um, ladies and gentlemen. I'm I'm Marcus Cooper. I'm the lead for the Trimble's Fit for Purpose um, initiative. Um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to present here, um, and I would like to thank you for the invitation. Today, I will discuss um, how we can accelerate fit for purpose um, land registration efforts, and I want to introduce you um, our tool set for fit for purpose. Okay. Um, the fit for purpose approach, um, Samuel uh, talked also um, before about fit for purpose, um, provides opportunities for land administration systems to deliver benefits, including secure tenure rights um, to a wide range of stakeholders within a relatively short time and for a relatively uh, affordable cost in a flexible manner. Implementing um, sustainable and affordable land administration systems in, in countries, enabling um, security of tender for all and effective management of land use and natural resources. This in turn will um, then end up in economic um, growth, social equality, and environmental um, sustainability. Registering um, parcels, tender rights um, um, in a meaningful time frame requires new approaches. 
Many of the products currently available in the market for fit for purpose or field data collection for land administration are suboptimal and insufficient. Sometimes they are too complicated, too, too much high end um, solutions, um, too expensive then, or sometimes there are just GIS um, um, orientated, so they could not really handle um, the geometry of a parcel, for example, uh, they are form based um, or they are too complicated. To accelerate um, the land administration data collection process, we identify a tool set which suit to the fit for purpose concept. With these tools, we want to collect more data faster with more field crews. The tool set needs to be flexible, scalable, configurable, collaborative, and of course, affordable. The tools we identify are a software application, of course. We need data collector and handhelds. We need GNSS hardware, and of course, GNSS correction services. Now I want to introduce you these tools and talk about the capabilities these tools need to have to accelerate fit for purpose data collection. Let's begin with the first tool in this tool set, the field software application. We need a tool which is really designed for collection of land administration data. Trimble PenMap for Android is a low cost but professional software for everyone which means with a minimum of training, this application can be used by professional land surveyors and for example, community members as well. PenMap is able to easily capture and edit coordinates, geometries, and as well GIS attributes. For registering parcel and tender data, support of domain models like STDM or LADM are important. PenMap supports these kind of models. In order to simplify the collection for the users as much as possible, the PenMap user interface is easy to use, interactive and map-based. The map-based interface helps for the involvement of the community, for example, in a general and fixed boundary process. What we see here on the screen is the pen map software with an aerial map in the background um, and with um, collected data um, in the foreground with these purple lines and these blue nodes. Um, pen map Android provides simple tools for the data collection. For example, a digitizing function, GNSS measurements, or several COGO functionalities. PenMap supports internal Android GNSS, Trimble Catalyst GNSS, and other Trimble GNSS receivers. The software PenMap offers a flexible subscription-based pricing. Subscription means pay for project time, scale up and down the, the number of field crews if needed, and product maintenance is included. I talked about land administration um, and for, for the software, what does that mean? We need an application um, which is able to collect spatial data. For example, parcels, buildings, geometries, agriculture structure, and so on. We need to collect as well non-spatial data, like persons, parties, households, companies, and the relationship between the spatial data and the non-spatial data. And this kind of relationship could also carry attributes. For example, is it an ownership or a tenant or community owned um, um, uh, um, uh, um, structure. 
Trimble pen map is such um, an application. And I want to show you now live how easy it is to collect and edit data with pen map. We will show you live how to collect some new persons, owners, edit an existing parcel, collect a new parcel, and add owner relationship to the parcel. Okay, let's move over to the software. I hope you can see the software now. So what we see here on the screen is um, the project overview of PenMap. So I can tap here to my project and I can start my project. What we see here is, um, is again, the same like the screenshot. This is now live. Um, we can move around here a little bit with the fingertip. Um, we can zoom in. So it's, a, it's an Android-based application, very easy to use. Um, we see an aerial image in the background. We see these purple lines here in the foreground. Um, we see that we have a large map area um, that you will really see your map. I just opened the side menu here and I want to show you now the GIS manager. I tap on the GIS manager and we see here that we have um, a person, pictures, resources and several structures. I tap on structure and now I, I get a list of my already collected spatial data, parcels, for example, our structure. I can, can select a structure, for example, the structure with the number 99. I can edit here the attributes if I want to. For example, utilities available in this structure, okay. Save. And I can, I would say, navigate or zoom to the structure. Here's my structure 99. I go back to the GIS manager and now I want to, to add some new persons. Um, we see there is already a person. I can edit this person as well. Jim, male, singer, and so on. Um, I want to add a new person. Esther. Moore, for example, identification card. I type in a number here, gender, female, date of birth. I'm not sure what the date of birth is. <laughs> so I'm not sure. So I guess she's married. Um, telephone number, address. Um, I can add a spatial data. Um, this is an attribute. And for example, a relationship to the household. Is she, um, for example, the wife in the household? I can add some attributes here, um, documents. Um, for example, a picture. I can add a picture, activate the camera. Um, I can add another picture, for example, an identity card. Or I can add a signature. So all these, um, I would say, documents are now stored to our new collected person, Esther Moore. I can save that. We see now that we have two persons in our database. If I, for example, did a mistake or something like that, I can edit again and check here the attributes. Okay, now we have two um, persons in our database. 
we go back here um, to our parcel. Um, now I want to, to check here my, my data. We see here that, that here are some points, um, but it seems like these points are not really fit to um, the reality. Um, I want to edit now these, um, these objects here. I go to move node. I select the node, 38. Now I want to um, move this node with our digitizing function. So I select the digitizing function. And now you can see that the point 38 has moved. I can do that again, move node, select point 39, okay. Okay, so now I have edited um, existing data in the database. Um, now I want to select or create a new parcel. I select here parcel um, on the right top corner. So I can select here several other codes. Um, behind here are some, some more. This, of course, is um, an example, I would say, model example template. So the template can be adjusted, of course. So now I want to select um, a new parcel. PenMap is an intelligent software, and we don't want to um, have redundant points. So the corner here is already existing, point 36. I want to reuse it and select the method snap node. I snap the point 36, select free node, and now I go forward and digitize my parcel. So very, very easy to use. The user directly see what happens um, and directly um, see the parcel here. Now I want to close the parcel. Ownership, private, related structure. So in to our parcel, there's no store. Um, is it already um, known by the authorities? Yes. Utilities again, okay. And now um, we want to um, add a relationship to that. So now we have collected a spatial data and we want to collect the relationship to a person. So we add a relationship and we say, okay, it's the ownership. And this is 100% tender share. And now we can add a new person or we select a person from our database. I select a person from our database and this is owned by Esther. So now Esther is linked um, to this parcel. Of course, Esther could own more than one parcel. So it's, it's possible that she owned three or more parcels. Um, um, Samuel also talked about uh, conflicts. Of course, PenMap is also able to collect a conflict. I can add here a dispute status, for example. Is there a dispute? No, there's no dispute. Now this dispute is um, connected to this tender share and to this person and to this parcel. I can also um, add a document again with the camera. And this document is now linked to our um, relationship, say.
if I if I want to activate GNSS, I press the GNSS button, and now um, the satellites pops in here. Um, GPS, GLONASS, Galileo. Um, now my antenna um, is it visible already. It's not visible. So I'm too far away from um, this area now. So you see that that's very easy um, to collect data with, with PenMap. Um, we have also several um, construction methods here, chain offset, and so on and so on. Um, we can stake out a point. Um, we can collect with GNSS and several um, epochs of GNSS. So it's, it's very easy to use. Um, it's designed to collect tender data. Um, and um, and uh, I hope you are now curious um, to, uh, to learn more about um, our solution. So I go back to the PowerPoint. Um, yeah, and let's move, move to the data collector. Um, we want to collect more data with more crews. So for that case, we need um, affordable data collectors for this wider set of field crews. Android operating system is worldwide available. Android systems are inexpensive and offer multiple form factors, which are then well suited for the field work. Android-based devices worldwide enable stakeholders and organization to use bring your own device. So you can use a ruggedized professional data collector like this um, display TD, uh, TDC 600 from Trimble, or you can use any other Android device which suits for your fieldwork, a tablet or smartphone. Um, there are several um, devices in the market. The last piece of um, our fit for purpose tool set include the GNSS hardware and GNSS corrections. We want to equip more field crews with GNSS accuracy, but this GNSS needs to be working worldwide. It needs to work in online and offline conditions. And it needs to be inexpensive if we want to run more field crews. Trimble Catalyst is such a GNSS system which meet the needs of fit for purpose. The system is plug and play, which means it's configuration free in conjunction with Trimble PenMap. No experts are needed to work with Trimble Catalyst. It's low cost. It's as a service based GNSS positioning, which contains in our system the hardware and the corrections. This provides fit for purpose data collection efforts with needed flexibility and scalability. This allows to equip more field crews with GNSS, which then collect more accurate data. Um, I talked a lot about flexibility and scalability, and I want to give you an, an easy example. So um, we have two field crews, and of course, these two field crews, if they want to work with Trimble Catalyst and PenMap, they need to have um, two antennas. So field crew one, antenna one, and field crew two, antenna two. Now we, we ordered, um, a pool, I would say, of Catalyst subscription and a pool of PenMap subscription, for example, with submeter accuracy. Now I can share these, um, these 12 subscriptions to six months accuracy each. Or I share that nine months for Q, crew two, one, and three months for the Q2. Or I, I want to add 
another field crew, um, I order a new antenna. It's a low cost antenna. And I share the existing subscriptions to these um, third crew. So six um, months uh, accuracy for the first crew, three months for the second, and again, three months for um, field crew three. These, these subscriptions don't need to be in order. So for example, um, maybe in, in, uh, there is a, a month um, where is uh, no field uh, work possible? It's too hot, or it's it's um, it's a time where the people are working on the fields, and uh, there's no uh, time to collect land administration data. Um, so you can skip months and uh, not have to be in order these uh, six or these three um, subscriptions. So you can really act. Um, and scale up and down, you are very uh, flexible with your field crews, with the system um, like PenMap and in conjunction with Catalyst. A really important piece um, for a solution like that is the implementation of all elements, software, hardware, and correction service needs to be connected and work effectively together. Customization to meet the needs of the project of the country is important. For example, the country specific domain model or reports or legal regulations, um, they need to be implemented by professionals in the software. Also processes and workflows um, need to be customized to create better results and effective data transfers. Training support is needed and support maintenance and services are needed for a complete duration of, an, of an initiatives. Um, Trimble offers stability, scalability and reliability for millions of users worldwide. We are ready to offer this to fit for purpose land administration initiatives as well. So Trimble offers a complete field data collection tool set. PenMap for Android, subscription-based software for um, data collection. Our software is running on Android, so bring your own device is possible, with, which offers a bunch of low-cost data collectors. Trimble also offers own data collectors, ruggedized for professionals. And GNSS as a service with Trimble Catalyst, a low cost GNSS hardware in conjunction with a worldwide available GNSS correction service. The question in the beginning of my presentation was how to accelerate fit for purpose data collection with a tool set which is designed for fit for purpose. We want to collect more data more quickly with more crews. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Marcos, for telling us about those two uh, packages. I know that there are a variety of products from Trimble, but you have uh, maybe because of the time chosen to display those two devices, the Treble Catalyst and the PEMAP2. Thank you very much for that. Um, also, likewise, we will be taking question and answer after we have our third speaker from ESRI having his presentation. So, um, so thank you very much, Popa. You can stop sharing your screen now. So next, we will be having Kirsten from S3 for the next presentation. Hello, Kirsten.
Hello, uh, sorry, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's all this, uh, these screens here and buttons, but it's okay. I will share my screen now, now and, and good morning, everyone. Um, can, you, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to share it in, in this mode. So first of all, thank you for um, inviting us to, to uh, present at this uh, very important meeting. And um, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, the ESRI approach uh, to land administration. And as you know, we work in collaboration with a lot of different partners like, like Trimble. Um, so we are going to share a vision, the ESRI vision for Nigeria. And, and for land administration in general. And let me just see if I can progress this. Um, so I don't know if you know Esri, but very, very quickly, uh, we're a privately owned company based in, in the United States in, in California. We have more than 100 offices around the world um, and in uh, seven, it actually gets up to 76 countries. We have distributors and partners. And we basically operate in, in most countries of the world right now. Um, the ESRI software called ArcGIS is uh, used by more than 350,000 organizations. Um, and most importantly, the most national government uses the ESRI software across sectors, whether it's, it's, it's uh, for utilities, it's for land, it's for tax taxation and so forth. Um, we basically spend 30% of our revenue working with our clients, our customers to develop the software. So the S3 software you see is actually very much driven by the need of our customers. And, and you'll see that, that very clearly. And like I said, we support a, a lot of governments across governments. Um, the way we look at land administration, and it actually ties really well into what Marcus was showing from, from Trimble is that we see land administration as six component. And that, that is where uh, our software provides that ESRI geospatial infrastructure that can support all these components of land administration. But not only land administration, but also other government work because land administration is just part, one part of the whole government operation. But going back to land administration, the way we see it is that we see it in these six component being land tenure, uh, which is all about um, the cadastre primarily and, and the titling the land registry, plus other things. And by the way, we will share these slides. It, it's about land valuation, uh, where you have all the appraisals, the valuations to support tax mapping. It's about the land use, where you have permitting in, in inspections, where you also plan for the land, you do land use planning and, and you allocate different types of, of land uses that then are given to the land development to start to develop the land. And that can be whether it's agriculture or light industry, heavy industry, it's urban areas, whatever it is. Um, but in that sense, it's, it's also about the whole planning and the transaction here. And then of course we have the land market um, where you have real estate, mortgage and insurance. All this ties into what we call the land information system, which is the sixth component. So having this in mind, what I'm going to talk about today, given the time we have, is just land tenure and land valuation, because I've been to, to Kenya or to Nigeria, sorry, many times. I've had the pleasure of visiting some of you in the States and have seen kind of the lay of the land. And the immediate need that there is in Nigeria is really to get land tenure and land valuation under control and start to generate revenue. But I'll show that uh, basically right now in this slide. So why is this important and, and how can ESRI support this? Well, if, if you look at this slide, and I hope you can see this, that if you look at the left, you can see the dark areas. This is what we call the foregone capital, or I, I joke and call it the, the dark capital. This is the capital that nobody sees. This is a capital government don't see. But what it is, is that land is just sitting there. And this is the case in Nigeria. It's actually the case in a lot of countries worldwide that we've seen are working with. But you have land sitting there, land gets sold and owner gets paid and nobody sees it, it's never registered anymore. But what happens if we register it? And I, I really wanna have you pay attention to this slide because this is really the engine of, of everything we're talking about and with everything that you've seen so far. But let's say land gets registered 
and we can sit down here. That means that we can put a value on lane. And why is that important? Well, when lane has a value, we can actually tax it. When we tax it, government can get revenue. But also if lands get sold to a certain value, owner gets paid and now you can have a fee on that. You can actually have, there are different ways of betterment tax and so forth that you can get here. So there is a revenue. The point is that when government gets revenue, it can invest, it can invest back in the society and start to attract capital and, and uh, you know, uh, do uh, market development and so forth. You can also start to develop certain areas. So let's say we're looking at Lagos, you know, there's a huge influx in Lagos of informal settlements. If you start to develop in those areas or uh, start to legalize some of these areas, you then can increase the value of the land and you start to get the idea, you can tax it, you get the revenue. So here we have a cycle. So this is really a dynamic model. But also when land gets valuated, owner can go down and get a loan. So now we're looking into the whole mortgage and, and banking industry. And owner can buy more land that can get registered and get valued and so forth. So that's another engine. Or when owner has land, they can start to build on the land. It gets valued, more value tax and so forth. Um, so the whole thing here is that to drive Nigeria forward, to start to do uh, financial diversification away from the oil and the dependency of oil, you really need to do the land. And I want to quote a number I read in the New York Times saying that more than 80% of all value in land or value in the world or um, ownership in the world uh, is actually tied to land. So land plays a really, really important play here. So in your case, um, and, and what I've seen in Nigeria is that everybody is trying to release the capital that's sitting in land to generate revenue to, to, and then you know, create pro, uh, progress and prosperity for, for uh, Nigerian citizens. Um, so uh, we created this slide just to show you where you actually have potential revenue streams. So in tenure, it's with registration, you have in valuation, land use, land development, and land market. And you can, all, all, you, you can see that in this slide, but the point is that if you take this, you have here, this, these are ways where you can start to generate revenue and especially around the two first ones as the little diagram before showed you. But that is the immediate benefit, but there's also a downstream effect, you know, into everybody who's actually um, working with land and are um, uh, having developed um, uh, industries or business around land that also then can start to be taxed. And I know, for example, in some of the states you register a small and medium companies and you tax these, and this is basically what you're looking at under the line here. So there's another driver you, you can get in. So again, I hope you get the message that it's really important to get land. And I'm just talking about the financial aspects here, not about the whole so social tenure and tenure security. But, um, and, and Mark has talked about fit for purpose. Um, so really what that is, is that you, you need to look at the continuum of rights and, and many land projects in, in Africa, especially and other parts of the world have focused on very formal, formal uh, creating very formal uh, boundaries and so, or cadastres. And the reality is, is quite different. And it's not that you can't create formal cadastres, but it just takes a long time. And, and you can see that, especially in Northern part of Europe where it's taken at least a hundred years to do that. Even if it were to use the best of the technology, it will still take some time. So the point here is that this is really fit for purpose that you're looking at here, what we call the continuum of rights. So you need to think about when you build this whole tenure system, the cadastre, that you can support different types of cadastre within the same model. And then what you can do, you could say in, in certain rural areas, you might just have a location and you can make a record. It could even just be an address. Uh, and you can start to, to put a valuation on that address because you have a land description. And as time move forward, you can just start to move towards a formal land rights system. So the whole thing here is that you need to think about putting this uh, structure in place so you can support this fit for purpose. And as you get data in there, you move towards the right. Traveling through the world, as I've done, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm a cadastral surveyor, so, so I may be looking at it a little different. But the point is that a lot of land administration entities, and especially in Africa, are having some challenges. You know, they are having uh, challenges with the ICT, the infrastructure, to actually conduct real estate uh, registration. Uh, systems are either not in place, not mature. 
the technical capabilities, there still needs to be a lot of technical enablement of, of local workforces to be able to handle some of these systems. And the integration to various business systems is simply not there. Um, the same with data. Um, data is coming from different sources. Um, you know, some of it is questionable. Some of it is in non-digital format. A lot of it is kind of deteriorating. Data is not linked. Um, and there's really no systems in place so you can share data between entities. And then of course, the whole enablement, the knowledge is also a challenge where people uh, need to get a better understanding on how to utilize, uh, you know, this whole technology with GIS. And of course, what I'm talking about here is GIS based land demonstration. So what can we do to, to help all this, how, you know, and the way ESRI, ESRI operates, and again, in collaboration with our partners is that we've, we, we've gone in over the last five, six years and changed our whole technology approach to something we call initial operational capabilities. And what that is, is that we, instead of you having to buy some, some software, uh, maybe even hardware that just sits there, what we wanna do is we wanna give it into your hands and you can run with it right away. And we have done this successfully in, in several places in the world um, of what I'm basically talking about right now. So um, when we talk about initial uh, capabilities, it's really that we stand up, give you the software. Um, we can do uh, field operations, uh, like what you just saw with Marcus. Um, we can do data analysis, data capture, we have up here. We can actually constantly real time provide reports so managers can see you know, how much was surveyed today or you know, how many, uh, how many registrations did we get today um, and so forth. Um, we can also very easily put out data. So if somebody wants to look up their uh, property, they can just, you know, on a mobile device, just look at the property. We have a concept saying anywhere, any device, any time. And, and that basically goes to most of what I'm going to show you today. But the whole idea is that everything comes together here in, in this one land administration system. Uh, so what we talk about is really a uh, geospatial infrastructure that, that can support this. Again, data management, interesting model right out of the bat. Uh, and we are working very closely with both the UN and, and ISO around the land administration domain model, uh, which the UN has kind of put forward as being the model uh, to operate on. We have a lot of tools just to do data editing out of the box um, from imagery to, to digitizing uh, to automated feature extraction. Um, we can do modeling. Of course, working with uh, uh, CAD, we are fully one-to-one uh, -one integrated with CAD, almost from just simple drawings to very advanced uh, BIM models that we can just pull right in and work with 3D slash 4D objects. I don't see that being the case here at this point, but, but it's there. And then of course, data quality, we can do a lot around data quality and data quality checks. They can be manual, semi-automated or fully automated. So in that sense, um, what we really can support is that knowledge is built into the system. So you're not so dependent on people knowledge. You're really today with today's technology, you're enabling you're basically able to put in technology into um, the system or knowledge into the system. Workforce management, if, if you have, whether it's your own surveyors or it's licensed surveyors, you can track them in the field, you can assign jobs to them in the field and so forth. So we have out of the box capabilities to do that. Um, when we talk about configure field application and, and this alludes to what you saw from, from, from Marcus, we have several uh, field applications that, that can be supported here. And let me just, I hope this would have started. But what you can see here is that um, with these field applications, you can configure um, your data collection. So what I would have shown you here is the lady here is really with the GNS S receiver and the collector. And she's working with the local surveyors to mark down her property in, in true fit for purpose uh, uh, way, uh, where, they, where it actually is a collaboration between the community and, and the surveyors uh, to see where are, are the boundaries here. And the ESRI software, the ArcGIS software and the mobile capabilities basically allows you within an hour to configure this, no programming, just configure this and be up and running, communicating real time through the phone uh, with the system back in the office where you then can, can track, track and so forth. 
Um, back in the office, you can then look at the data in what we call, uh, giving you what we call an operational overview. And in this overview, you can get literally information about anything. And, and I, I, we've shown this to several governors <laughs> throughout Nigeria. They really like this because they can actually see what's going on within the organization. But the idea is, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can actually track information on the fly or you can generate reports. <clears throat> and again, no programming, all is just configurable. One thing I want to highlight and that we've seen a lot within the last one and a half year, and I know there is an ongoing project in Nigeria with the World Bank uh, right now to, to, to use some of this technology to, to uh, do what I'm talking about here is true imagery. So there is a, a plethora of image, image, imagery available at, at different resolutions and so forth. But the technology is falling along and especially Esri has spent a lot of research and, and, and we are deploying um, tools where you actually can implement uh, machine learning and AI with image processing um, and especially with feature extraction. So um, the project with the World Bank right now is to extract buildings and then go on site and, and value, uh, value um, these buildings. But what the technology can do here is that they can, it can actually extract building footprints from satellite imagery. Um, <clears throat> and there are different techniques and different types of imageries to do that. Um, we can also start to uh, define uh, usage boundaries and especially in rural areas with agricultural fields, this, this is being used. But all this can then go into map production where you basically generate maps on the fly Another thing, and I'm not going to demo anything here today uh, because of the short time we have, but if we, if we were going to set up a, set, a different uh, session, uh, next session, we would be happy to come in and show you some of these capabilities. But one here I wanna highlight is drone to map. And, and from, from a surveyor's point of view, this is really interesting because you can on the fly generate a control network uh, and then what you can do is you can fly a drone, take pictures, you can do auto rectification down to centimeters accuracy. And then what you can do is you can literally digitize or use AI machine learning to extract features from that, that imagery. So from a surveyor's point of view, it's completely new technology on how we uh, capture data. And I just want, to bear, just want you to bear in mind that if you think about the slide I showed you with the continuum of rights, um, one of the things we're working on uh, in, in Eastern Africa is to do exactly that, do initial registration that would allow security of tenure and valuation and taxation. And then as you sell the property, we move into a more form formal boundary survey. And I know that there are provisions in the Nigerian uh, survey manual to, to do exactly the same. So this is one way for you to actually get double work, if I may say so. But back to this one, the idea is that you can actually do a lot of uh, AI and, and uh, machine learning. Um, so one case I just mentioned is the feature extraction of property boundaries. Um, you could also have cars driving down the street and just basically video uh, the storefronts and uh, an AI can be um, um, trained to see, well, is this a commercial building? Is this a residential building? Is it this an industry and so forth? And likewise, we can do um, classifications, and I'm going to show you a slide in, in a moment here on, on valuation. And again, this is also from deep learning um, and, and machine learning. But most importantly, uh, in this context is that out of the box, uh, when you get an RTIS Pro um, uh, desktop, you will have all the, the capabilities of partial fabric. So partial fabric is a specialized data set designed specifically for personal management. So this can become your repository. And the beauty about it is that even though that I'm showing very formal surveys in this uh, diagram, or these three animations here, um, it can actually support the fit for purpose. Uh, so you could, could easily start with a point that moves into a, a line construction that moves into a polygon that moves into a measurement network. So it, it, it supports the full, the full spectrum here. It works on desktop, it works in enterprise, and it works on the web. So again, anytime, anywhere, any device. Um, 
what's important for surveyors is that you can actually start to, to, to treat your data like a true survey network. And you can do these for adjustments, you can do transformations, you can do closures and so forth. Um, more importantly, historical parcels are tracked. So you can now start to see a whole trace of how parcels were subdivided and the history of, of these parcels. There's integrity. So it's almost like the old vector topology model where there cannot be overlaps or there can be overlaps in certain cases, but it's really line by line. <clears throat> and there is a lot of quality management tools in here. So there are actually workflows that can be configured that can take some of these tools for quality management and ensure that the data is really to the quality that it needs. And one thing I'm not going to talk about here is the whole security aspect about <clears throat> or authentication authorization to get into data, get into workflows and so forth. But we have all that as well uh, because we are a platform. And because like I said, this is a service oriented architecture, any device, uh, anytime, anywhere, uh, this, this is what you can do. And I already alluded to this supports um, um, the fit for purpose. So if we were to put this into a context of, of the Nigerian states, um, what you're primarily doing out in the States is that you're digitizing and loading data you, or you're verifying cleaning and data. You're going out and doing surveys or you register land records and you tie all this together. And the RTIS platform can, can support that. It can support that you move into an enterprise environment and share the data with other users. Um, and what it can do is that you can also support the preparation and publication of data. And, and let me just give you an example of that. So for example, um, there is the Africa Geo Portal. And this is really a one-stop shop a portal for geographic context or a content where there's uh, tools, geo, uh, geospatial tools that you can use to work with data, but there's also data available. So the idea is this is a place where you share data, whether it's survey data or it's partial data, it's, it's valuation data. Uh, it could be any type of data that you put out on, on the Nigerian portal. And um, it's already there. So th the portal is already in place uh, and it's used by uh, all countries in Africa. They're publishing data uh, up there. And uh, let me just see if I can get my, so what you can see is that there are dashboards for COVID. Um, these are all the types of data. There are currently 63 data sets that you can go in and you can get, we have some from the presidential task force and so forth. So here there are data where you actually can go in, share the data and, and collaborate around this data. And again, uh, we would be happy to, to demo this, um, this further. But looking at, at, at just land titling and, and, and um, uh, cadastro survey. Um, in, in our view, there are five initial work streams that you need to focus on. One is to say, well, we actually get survey files that we need to get into the system. This is the first work stream. We have a second work stream uh, where you, you go out and you capture new data. It could be that you are going to capture work stream three up here is that you're going to capture data from imagery where you either digitize, you apply AI machine learning to extract data. It could also be that you already have existing data in place that you need to load and verify. And then uh, a work stream five is to make sure that the data can be shared. So these are the five work streams that we've analyzed that would be very important for you to focus on immediately. And this is where, of course, we can build a, a geospatial infrastructure that can support that or to actually not build it, we can just deploy it. Um, another one for valuation assessment is Kind of the same, but it, it is really that you go out, you capture your data using uh, uh, the field uh, uh, applications like survey one, two, three, collector, field maps, and so forth. So we have different applications, and they can run on a, a cell phone or or you know on on a device. Workstream two again is to go in, uh, say, get data, run statistics, run assessments, and calculate values. So this is more a back end process. Uh, work stream three, the same, you can capture data that's already in place, or you can load data that's in place and you can then share the data. But let me just show you very quickly what I'm talking about here for valuation. So in this case, it's from Rwanda in Kigali. And one of the, the challenges that they had was that they didn't have a lot of sales data or 
or a lot of data on a lot of the buildings in, in uh, Kigali. And what they wanted to do is were to get an estimate of how much would, would an apartment sales value be on, on all the buildings in Kigali. So they used the RTIS platform and especially RTIS Pro Spatial Analyst um, and, and some of the, uh, the regression tools in here to, to build a, uh, first of all, they prepared a set of base, base data with all the building data. So where you have the highlights here is where they actually had data. Then they took that data and they started to train a valuation model. And in, in this case, it's a hierarchical model, statistical model and trained that. And then they start to say, well, down here, it, can we predict uh, values? And I don't know if you can see it, but it actually showed that there are different uh, parameters or different properties of, of, of a property that had importance. So one of them were plot size, another one was the number of bathrooms or if there were a bathroom uh, or electricity and so forth. But based on that, they could then apply that to the rest of the buildings. They used the RTIS survey one, two, three to, to go out and actually register the buildings that weren't on sales tax. And then they could run that through the model. And then they could build an estimate and say, this is the approximate sales value for this, uh, this building. And based on that, you can then build a tax scheme to provide uh, taxation um, uh, information and, and get tax revenue. Um, but this is really where we're, where we're seeing it. You need to do that first registration. You then need to do a valuation assessment, hand that information to the th tax authorities that then can start to generate the revenue for the states. But to do so, it's very important that everybody in the state and even between the state talks the same language. So you need to develop a unified data model. And again, um, going with the LADM, and uh, the RTIS platform, you can you can combine all types of data. And this is just an example, of whether it's CAD BIM, uh, it's LIDAR, whether it's vector, 3D or imagery, we can all combine that into uh, the same data model. Having the same data model will then allow you to start to build your whole data infrastructure around uh, within the, the state and, and even within in the country. Um, and in this sense, having that data model and, and using the uh, capabilities of, of the geospatial infrastructure, you can then share data freely. So you could basically have services talking to services and just updating data, if that's what you want. But I've used this word geospatial infrastructure a couple of times. And, and what we see is that it's way, way, way more than, than software. It, it's really not only about the software, it's about the hardware that the software is on. The way you operate, um, the way you organize yourself around operating uh, these types of technologies, the standards that, that ensures that you get in authoritative data, you know, identity, who is actually going to get access and to what, because there's a lot of fraudulent surveys and registration going on. And I've seen this throughout Africa. So by starting to integrate uh, identity and security, you can start to get your hands around that. Um, there's the whole governance into the workflows, um, what functionality you have, uh, policies behind it, who's responsible for what, who is allowed to do what, and so forth. Uh, so that's when we talk about geospatial infrastructure, that these are things that we uh, actually can, can help with. And when we talk about deployment options, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we really can say, well, you can deploy in the desktop, the enterprise or the cloud. So if you were to initially start with a little project, you can do that on a desktop. But having the SRE platform, you could move that very quickly up to an enterprise. You can just deploy it on an enterprise system instead. Or you can say, well, we really don't have the hardware. We don't have the capabilities. So we can deploy it in the cloud. Or we can deploy some of it in the cloud and some of it locally. And one of the things that we've seen in Nigeria is that the whole, what we call the transactional component of data is deployed on local enterprise servers or local desktops. And when you publish data, that's where you, you utilize the cloud. But this, this slide is actually very important because what it tells you is that you have uh, almost infinite amount of deployment options, whether it's uh, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, or you just want to, to, to host it locally, whether it's on physical servers or it's on virtual machines, we support all of that, uh, again, out of the box. But again, we would be happy to, to, to talk about this further. 
So just to round off, and, and, and in my experience, um, and in Esri's experience, the Nigerian state land administration system, how would you go about and do this? So what we're doing with a lot of, uh, with some other states and, and other countries and states in other countries, is that we actually uh, take an initial approach where we say, let's do a proof of concept. Because once you have the, this whole infrastructure in place, you can very quickly scale it up horizontally and vertically. vertically, vertically. So even though that you just start small, you can grow big almost in a couple of weeks uh, just by scaling it up. And again, I would say that this, this whole approach is scale free, so you can make it as big as you want. But the idea is that you go through, um, in, our, in our experience, about seven phases. And, and I, I don't wanna go into too, too much detail here because we, we should give some time for Q&A. But, but the idea is that you, first of all, you plan and design. And one of the things, because all the 38 states in Nigeria have exactly the same challenges, one way to do this is to say, well, why don't you collaborate? Why don't you let us help you collaborate? And when you do it for one state, everybody can actually uh, leverage that so you get you build a repeatable pattern and this is very much what we do uh, here at Esther we try to build repeatable patterns that everybody can benefit from from or cl one client to, to another client but the idea is that you do the the planning and design then you to do the proof of concept you install the software um, no high availability keep it very simple as soon as you start to move into the high availability world it's going to be very expensive um, and that's not because of Esri, it's just because of the ICT infrastructure. Um, it's about training. Um, then, like I said, proof of concept for selected pilot areas um, and really focus on what data do we have, what data do we need to collect, how do we bring it into a, a, a common uh, data model, and how can we clean the data, and, and how can we then uh, share the data, and basically build our workflow processes around this how can we link to, to, to the land registry? Again, consolidation, like I said, of, of the current data structure. Um, we have extract, uh, transform, and load uh, that you can configure that basically can move data from one structure to a, a different structure. Um, if there already is data, in our experience, uh, that data needs to be uh, reviewed probably needs to be cleaned and converted to, to move into a new new data structure that can support all, all parts of government. Um, and then there's the whole th uh, dissemination, the data sharing, you know, who can do what, what type of data do they need, what type of services, because we can share not only data, we can also share services, we can share uh, web maps, uh, applications, whether it's desktop applications or, or a uh, mobile application, depending on the context that they are going to be used in. And then of course, uh, training is, is a very big part on, on, on that. We uh, then propose that once all this space structure is in place that you start to introduce semi-automated workflows, build that up, you start to integrate with other business systems. And if we're just talking about cadastro, you know, this is where you absolutely collaborate with the land registry and the taxation to get that trinity to, to work together. So I've just run over this very quickly and we would be happy to go into some more detailed discussion either uh, around each of these or um, just a com combined presentation. But we've talked about how do you implement, we've talked about uh, system architecture, the data management, the data models, parcel data, automation. Um, we've talked about uh, GeoAI and uh, machine learning um, implementation and, and some suggested next steps. And uh, our contact information is um, actually here in case uh, you want to get more information. So with that, uh, I would like to say thank you so much for, for listening in. And um, if there are any questions, we would be happy to, to uh, answer these. Thank you very much, Kasim. It was a very uh, knowledge that you shared. And we so much appreciate your efforts. Um, we, we, we like the fact that the S3 system brings together a, a robust solution for land administration, which is the parcel fabric, which allows you to manage your, your land record, allows you to manage historical records, and so on, especially makes the data collection process a, a, a unique process that allows you to collect data set that is fit for purpose. 
Um, so uh, shortly we will be going into the question and answer session. I know that many of us here have a lot of questions that we want to ask. This is the right time to ask. If you can access the chat box, you can drop your questions there. We have some questions that were shared before uh, the Q and A session, which has been answered by the by the um, the speakers. So I'm quickly going to read out their answers for those who might not have access to those questions, to the answers. So the first question was asked by Tim, by Tim Lok, which says, there is this perspe perspective in Nigeria that GIS is limited only to land administration and mapping alone. This perception has created a cold war between surveyors and GIS analysts today. <laughs> in fact, uh, that, that's true because GIS analysts and surveyors, they are not usually in power. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, knowing that GIS today has more to do with spatial analysis for different geospatial phenomena, e.g. crime mapping, geospatial analysis of diseases, weather analysis, etc., than with mapping and land administration alone. This question has been answered by somewhere somewhere at the neuron, and this is this, uh, the response. Thank you for this question. My thoughts on this is that this perspective is wrong, and it is a misconception and lack of understanding. GIS can be used for a lot of things other than land administration and mapping. It is a tool for evidence-based decision-making in almost all sectors. The limit of its capabilities is the limit of your imagination. Wow. Any sector decisions are to be made. You can use GIS. Thank you very much, Sophie Adinero, for rightly answering this particular question. GIS is applicable in all, anything you can think about. Is it banking? Is it uh, supply chain management and so on? But for, the, for this conference, we are focusing on land administration. The next question was asked by Timothy when uh, Marcos was having his presentation on the pain map too. He says, what is the accuracy or error level of pain map? That was the first question. Or the second question was that, do you have to be a surveyor to deploy this app? And I'm going to read Marcos' response shortly. The application Trimble pain map Android is such easy to use that everyone could collect data with this tool. PEMAP supports several Trimble GNSS antennas up to the highest centimeter level. The accuracy of PEMAP depends on your GNSS. Trimble Catalyst is able to deliver up to centimeter level out of the box. Without CORS network ETC, you can get accuracy better than 50 centimeter. We offer our own correction service that is Trimble RTX via satellite or mobile network. This service is used in Trimble Catalyst. Of course, you could also use your own CORS. Uh, the second question was not answerable. I guess the right answer to that question is that you don't have to be a surveyor uh, to deploy any of these applications. There is another question that was asked during the uh, during the S3 presentation, I believe casting will be very willing to answer that question. The first, uh, Timothy said, is S3 working on developing automated building footprint extraction tools anytime soon? Yeah, I, I can answer that very easily and very happily and say we already have it. So if, if you have a, you know, a licensed S3 software, you can just go on to um, RTS Online and there is a model, there's actually two models. There is one model to extract building footprints. And the second model is to do lane classification. And we're working on a boundary model as well right now. But what I wanna say is that you don't necessarily need to, you don't necessarily need to wait or go, go in and, and, and uh, wait for what S3 develops. Um, in, in, in true S3 fashion, you can also go in and use the tools. And if you have local imagery available, for example, from drone to map, you can then have that imagery and, and you can start to train it, right? And once you've trained it, you can then start to extract the buildings because the buildings we have, um, you know, are trained on different data sets and there might be a, 
a, a different building structure in, in Nigeria, depending on what areas of Nigeria you're looking at, right? Or what part of the, the urban area you're looking at, what buildings. So one thing would be buildings in informal settlements, like you see in the outskirts of, of Lagos, for example, or other cities. And, and that another one would be the more affluent areas where you have villas and so forth. So, but we, we have it, absolutely. Thank you very much, Kasim. So the answer is yes, the, the building footprint extraction tool is already available. So it's just for you to explore the possibilities. Uh, there is another question here. Can I load vector data into PayMap? Can I work offline on PayMap? Marcos. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I want to answer this, this question. So yes, you can load um, vector data in several formats, for example, um, an S3 shape format or uh, GeoJSON is a format would we support, um, DXF, um, DWG, um, format. Um, you can also load um, WMS uh, services into the software or raster data in the software. And yes, you can work offline with the software. The software is a complete offline software. So there's no need for internet co connectivity. All right. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, when we sent out, when we sent out the, the links to this uh, event, we ask, uh, we, there is a, a portion there where you ask questions. We have some questions from the survey, which I'm going to read out now. The first one is that, what step is the Office of the Soviet General of the Federation taking to ensure each state embark on digitalization in land administration? Uh, so they are adding it on. I, I believe that question. Uh, can I take it live? Yes, please, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me start by saying this, that when I came on board or during my years, a younger officer through the system, I noticed a very low level of awareness of the capability of spatial information. And uh, concerning the effort I've been taking since the time I assumed office last year, I realized that geospatial should be brought to limelight. And uh, what, I start, what I had in mind as my foci was that to make more relevance, to create more impact, and then to do more advocacy. Apart from that, I've been interfacing with some state surveyor general. And before I go further, I want us to know that in Nigeria, solving a mapping is a concurrent legislative list. We are aware of the autonomy and independence of each and every state, but despite that, we still meet so that we will be telling them. And the, one of the things I realized that over the time, the action plan of people in Sovina, Mabi, particularly in government, have, they have not been aligning their program with government priority. These I've been telling my colleagues during our survey coordination, had, uh, survey coordination conference, we do that on yearly basis. For quite some time, we've not been able to do it properly, but we started doing the meetings since 2019 when I came on board. And uh, as part of my effort, I've initiated a kind of a forum for the Surveyor General to meet with Surveyor General of every state once a year. This year, we are looking at, I think, July or August to interface with my colleague in the state. And of course, from my own hand here, I've done a lot of advocacy on the importance and then the, the need for us to engage geospatial information to do what we need to do. Because we realized that the secret of many advanced nations is that they have prioritized acquisition of geospatial information and the use of it. You will, you will agree with me that uh, I think a UNGGI meeting of 2012, it was itemized that there are four criteria for good governance. First one is planning. The second one is uh, geospatial information. The third is finance. I think the fourth is human capital. 
their importance actually is in that order. You will realize that geospatial information came before finance. It wasn't a mistake. If you don't have the requisite geospatial information for any intervention anybody wants to do in government, you will not get the required answer. And I'm even happy that the same thing was said about the SDG 70 goals, that without the involvement of geospatial information, the, the 2030 realization of the agenda goals we will not be able to realize it. We have been doing this, I've been interfacing, and uh, at times when we even have some money, we do some work for some states. Like for instance, we did the mapping of Kano State last year and that of Ocean State, just to showcase and let them realize that these are what we have to do. Again, we have also been talking to a hierarchy and I've encouraged my colleagues in all the states that they should be more vibrant. They should let their hierarchy, their principal know the importance of solving and mapping. To a large extent in my last one and a half years in office, I've been able to impact some of these things. And maybe I didn't even say this, during the COVID-19 and up to now, we have been mapping COVID-19 results on daily basis. And uh, in any four hour, where, I mean, sorry, in any forum where I found myself, I've been trying to impress it on my colleagues that this is important. I've also been able to make it clear to some of our people in high position that geospatial information is key to all our development. I, I think I've addressed the question. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> so I'm going to take another question. Um, the, the question says, what product of Agile is best for land administrators? So um, I, I can answer that. So, so we have an RTIS uh, platform. And, and first of all, I just would like to echo what, what was mentioned by, by the Survey General. Um, that, you know, S3 is working very closely with the sustainable development goals in UNGGIM to, to promote the agenda. And, and one of the things, again, like I've said earlier, is that we have uh, the whole geospatial infrastructure in place to support that. And, and we would be happy to work, you, you know, uh, with the federal entities and, and the states to actually uh, help promote this and, 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 and have that um, uh, help them meet the, these, uh, these strategies. So, so back to your question <clears throat> about what parts of ESRI software, I would say the out of the box ESRI software uh, can do most of what I, I talked about. And the way ESRI software is that there is a core component um, that includes partial fabric uh, as one of the things. It has a ton of uh, tools to do data, uh, data, um, um, data checks, uh, quality checks, and, and actually also to, um, to propose data. So, or uh, to, to share data. So, so I would say, depending on, on ambitions, you can start with an RTIS Pro. Um, and if you're more like a state that wants to look at enterprise, you would start with an, 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 a standard RTIS enterprise server. And with that follows uh, some um, um, field tools and uh, some um, uh, RTIS Pro. So it, it, it all depends, which is the, the classical surveyor answer you, you would get. Um, but but I would say if, if you're just a single person, then start with, with RTS Pro. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Yeah, when you are using Agile Pro, you, 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 are, you are talking about using the parcel fabric. That's the, 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 the main element there for land administration. Thank you very much, Kirsten, for the answer. There are some other questions here which look similar to what have been answered already. Uh, one is about sustainable development, which Sylvia Adeneron already mentioned the, the steps the office has been taking over the past years. So thank you very much. Uh, on, the, uh, on this note, I want to ask if any of our speakers have uh, a closer remark to give. Let's start with Sylvia Adeneron. Thank you very much. I just want to thank the organizer of this conference. And uh, I'm quite happy they have been able to let comes to limelight and be able to come and speak our mind and uh, what we have been doing. 
I actually appreciate what we have been able to learn from other speakers too. Uh, I, I look forward by the grace of God to more of this type of conference from, uh, uh, from Sambos. And uh, I pray that uh, God will strengthen the company and be able to move from strength to strength. I also want to, I also want to thank my other colleagues who actually came on board to come and educate us on so many other things that we can do. Particularly the, the, the last speaker, but one, talking about land administration in Nigeria. Uh, by the grace of God, I will find time to interface with him or to get back to him. Or he, he can actually send a mail to me because we really need a lot of uh, assistance and cooperation in that line. Because we are fully aware that a lot of resources is tied into land administration. And this, we actually should embrace it and take advantage we can actually get from all the experts around us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate your efforts for joining us as well on this conference. It's my pleasure. Marcos, over to you, please. Do you have any closing remarks? Hello, Marcos. Oh, sorry. What was the question again? Yeah, I was asking if you have a closing remark. We are about to round up the, the, the conference. Oh, uh, I think I think that, that was a great um, event today and was a pleasure to, to present here. And uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for all these great questions and uh, to all presenters. Um, it was very um, interesting to listen to you as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Kastin, over to you, please. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I would like to, to thank everyone uh, for allowing us to come and present at this very important forum, because I, I think this is where things get started. It has to start somewhere. And I really hope and, and I would like to take up the, the Survey General's offer on, on, on helping. We we're absolutely would, would be delighted to do so and help put down strategies on, on how to move Nigeria forward. Um, and I know we're already in, in some ways doing that. Um, and again, you know, um, I would very much uh, again thank for the opportunity to, to present. And if there are further questions, or if you want us to show uh, other details of, of the capabilities of Esri software, and we just literally skated over it today, we would be, would be happy to have some follow-on sessions that we can arrange with Sampus, uh, where where you just can jump in and, and we will explain things. And I would also just want to say one thing that we actually have a user conference coming up uh, here uh, next week, I believe, or week after next. And uh, there are some sessions that are, if you're not an SRIM um, uh, uh, member, then um, you can log in and see some of the more uh, shared sessions about uh, where we're going. And, uh, but, but if you do have SRIM licenses, you can just register and you have free access to everything. So thank you so much. And, and this is a, wonderful form to, to be in. All right, thank you very much, Karsten. Now, uh, before I call on our JIRA manager in Nigeria for the closing remarks, I uh, want to welcome one or two contributions from the audience. If, uh, if anybody in the, office, uh, in the audience has something to say, you can use the raise hand button and we just call two people. Also, I have dropped a link on the, on the chat box. We want to have your feedback about this conference. We want you to share with us your thoughts, how the conference has been so far, if it was beneficial to you. If there is something we could do better, we would like to know. So please, the link is on the chat box. Kindly click on the link. That's the link that starts with https colon forward slash arcgis. So please, we will be expecting your responses to that, Sophie. So quickly, um, I can see one hand up. I'm going to call on Elijah. Elijah, I will allow you to talk now. Please go ahead. Thank you. OK, it's very great to be here. And I enjoyed every part of this program. 
Um, just like other speakers have said, I think uh, Samos has done a good job here bringing these um, interests together, the S3, uh, the Tremble, the Survey General. Uh, we have spoken uh, from different perspectives, but to a very particular agenda. Uh, to me, I think Samos is, is, is becoming more active now, like, or quite unlike I used to know, either because I didn't know before, I'm just, or I'm just getting to know, but that's a very good thing to appreciate. I, I, I hope that we'll continue this way. This kind of forum is always very important for us to talk together and um, identify gaps as well as find solutions to common uh, challenges. You see people ask questions, answers come in and knowledge is increased and that is what leads to action. Okay. When we talk about sustainability, these are things that actually drive it. So thank you to uh, Sambos and everyone who participated in this particular conference. All right, thank you very much. Elijah, for the, for the comments. Yes, we, we are active now more than before. Uh, before I call on our general manager, I noticed there is no body, there's, there's no one else raising their hands. Hello, can, any, can everybody hear me now? Hello? 